focus upon the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 27, verses 27 through 31. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. This is the gospel of our Lord. We've all witnessed bullying before. Maybe you even remember being the bully or the bullied a time or two. I still remember when I first got to high school, some of the older boys who were in my older brother's class decided that little Westra, as they called me, was going to be their victim for some time. You know, it, it seems as though the, the perception of bullying has changed pretty drastically over time. I think it used to be just kind of considered a, a rite of passage, that it was just a, a part of life, a part of growing up. But now, right, schools, workplaces, they've just about all, they've adopted this zero tolerance policy. Right, made it clear that bullying is, is not going to be tolerated. But even still, bullying is a widespread problem, isn't it? It can happen anywhere. It can happen at, at a school, it can happen at a workplace, and and it can even happen in the home. Now, when we think of bullying, the first thing that probably pops into our mind is the kind of physical bullying, right? The, the stereotypical shoving someone inside of their locker, right? That's probably what first pops into our mind. But according to the government website, stopbullying.gov, they, they broke it down into three categories, three types of bullying. There is verbal bullying, which occurs when you call names or threaten with violence. There's social bullying, which occurs when, when someone is deliberately and intentionally uh, cast out or ostracized from a group. And then, of course, there is physical bullying, which occurs when someone physically places their hands on another. Well, if we accept that website's description of bullying, well, then we would have to say that Jesus endured all three types of bullying. That throughout his earthly ministry, he was bullied verbally and socially by the Jewish leaders. And then after Jesus' arrest, things were taken up a notch, and now we see him suffering this, this physical violence at the hands of his enemies. And so this evening, that's what we, we're focusing on. We're, we're focusing upon the, the suffering that Jesus endured at the hands of those soldiers' brutality. Now, after Jesus' sham trial before the Sanhedrin and the high priest, Jesus was convicted of blasphemy. That was the charge that they brought against him. And so immediately they sent him off to the, to the Roman governor in Judea, Pontius Pilate, because they needed his approval to carry out the death sentence. Right? They needed Rome's authority to do that. And so they came down with their conviction, he's guilty of death, and they sent him off to the Roman authority. But Pilate meets with him, and he interviews him, and Pilate can see he's innocent. Pilate, right away, or pretty close to right away, is determined to set Jesus free. He can see that, that the only reason that Jesus is brought before them, brought before him, is because the Jewish leaders were jealous of him. But Pilate he was a politician first and a humanitarian in a far distant second. And so while he wanted Jesus to go free, he was kind of put into a corner here. The crowd was calling for blood. They were shouting out, crucify him. And so Pilate knew he had to take some sort of action. And so Pilate reasons that, well, how about I just subject Jesus to this good old-fashioned Roman brutality and maybe that will appease the bloodlust of this crowd calling for his blood. And so that's what Pilate does. He sends him off to his whole cohort of Roman soldiers, which could have been up to 600 of them. Pilate sends Jesus off to those soldiers for them 
to have their fun with him. And what those soldiers did was not for the squeamish. First, they, they, they whipped his bare back. And, and the whip that they used in, in Rome in this time, it was called a flagrum. And, and the, the ends of, of the strands, they had pieces of lead affixed to them that were designed to tear into the flesh, cause massive bleeding and internal injuries. The whole point of, of this whipping was really to just, to just weaken the victim, to just weaken them and, and break their spirit so that they don't put up any more resistance or fight to whatever other punishment comes next. It was brutal and it was cruel. Just as an example of how brutal it was, so the, the Jews, they put a limit on it. They said you could only be whipped so many times. The Romans, though, they had no such limit. And Jesus, at this time, was under the control of the Romans. And so after they, they beat him, after they whipped his bare back, now their cruel tactics switch to making fun of him, to mocking him. The charge they brought against Jesus was that he claimed to be king. And so the soldiers decide, let's dress him up for the part. And so they take a scarlet robe and they, they throw it over his shoulders. It was probably a soldier's cloak. And then they, they took this, this bramble of thorns and they weaved it together in a circle and they, they pressed it down onto his scalp as a, as a crown. And then finally, to complete the look, they, they found this reed, this stick, that they shoved into his weakened hand to be his rocker until they would later take it out of his hand to beat him with it. And with his outfit complete, now the, the soldiers, they, they bow down in front of him. They mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And then they took their turns, spitting in his face and beating him and striking him in the head again and again. You know, as we've been looking at the hands of the Passion, we've seen some hands do some pretty cruel things, haven't we? And yet throughout this, this series that we've been going through, we've been trying to avoid this prideful attitude of saying, wow, they sure were bad. I'm glad I'm not like them. Because that doesn't do us any good. But what application can we possibly draw from these, these brutal hands of the soldiers that, that beat and mocked the Savior? Well, that's the question I asked myself when Pastor Berner and I were dividing these lessons up, right? What application can be drawn from these soldiers? Right? I've, I've never used my hands to, to brutalize anyone. I'd like to say that maybe in my brief high school wrestling career, that maybe with my hands I, I did some damage to my opponent, but not even that can be said. And I'm guessing that's true for everyone here. We've probably never used our hands to physically beat someone up. But we all must admit, and we all ought to realize, that the same sinful nature that rested within the heart of those soldiers, the same sinful nature that rested within the heart of the, the worst bully to ever terrorize your high school, that same sinful nature is within our hearts too. And maybe that sinful nature shows itself in somewhat dis uh, different ways, but the sinful nature is still there in our hearts. And it shows itself in hearts that are selfish, that are primarily concerned about getting what we want, even if it has to come at the expense of someone else. It shows itself in hearts that are prideful, that, that really want it to be known just how superior we are. You know, maybe I'd like to think we've advanced at least beyond the barbaric uh, school cafeteria or playground, right, where there are physical displays of force and, and, and outright name-calling. But is it still the case that we want other people to know, that we want to prove just, just how intellectually or, or morally or socially economic superior we are? And then it becomes even more damning when we consider our sins of omission, the times we should have acted but, but didn't. You know, all the times that I refuse to help those who are in need. The times that I didn't speak up to defend those who were being bull verbally bullied. Or, or the times that I, I didn't invite or befriend those who were being outcast. Now, is it possible that, that we might see someone who is being bullied by 
by addiction or being bullied by an abusive relationship or, or maybe just bullied by an economic system that has left them behind. But instead of helping, we try to find excuses, right? We find excuses like the, the priest and the Levite skirting by on the other side of the road. And maybe we say, well, it's their own poor choices that got them in the mess, right? As if that could justify our indifference to their need. As if our Savior couldn't say that exact same thing about every sinner, including ourselves. It was their choices that got them in that mess. You know, there are those who might say the best way to, to, to uh, beat a bully, the best way to handle them is to fight back, right? Punch them in the mouth. That's the best way to do it. Of course, there's no honor in using your strength to, to beat up or to bully someone else. But there is perceived honor in using your strength to defend yourself, isn't there? And in fact, I would say there is perceived weakness and shame in just, just laying down and enabling yourself to just become someone else's punching bag. Right? That's not good. That's not healthy. So why do we see that from Jesus? That's exactly what he does, right? He just lays right down and he makes himself into a punching bag. Right? Why doesn't he fight back? Why doesn't he punch his enemies right in the mouth? We know he has the power. So why does he do nothing? Well, is this just part of Jesus, you know, walking the talk, you know, following through on what he preached about turning the other cheek? Well, this certainly is that, but there is a lot more at play here. You know, really, really every blow of that flagrum, every spat of spit thrown in his face, every, every insult he endured, all of it was in fulfillment of Scripture. All of this was foretold. The prophet Isaiah probably foretold and prophesied the most about it. So 600 years prior to this, Isaiah wrote about the promised Messiah. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. And also, he wrote, he was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And we could go on and on with examples from Scripture like this. But the point is the same. He let himself be brutalized. He offered his back. He offered his cheek. He did not oppose those who oppressed him. Willingly, Jesus endured this brutality. And willingly, he did so for you. Every blow, every wound, every drop of blood that was spilled, it was for you. It was for him living as your substitute. All of this was a part of the cup of suffering that, that God the Father had given to him to drink. And if Jesus shied away from that shame and indignity, if Jesus retreated away from that cross, if Jesus refused to drink just one drop of that suffering, well, then forgiveness would not be possible. This was necessary. This was prophesied. This is exactly what God said would happen. And Jesus carried it out perfectly. It's not a pretty sight that we see, is it? But look how thoroughly Jesus was brutalized. And know that's how thoroughly you are forgiven. There's a, an early Christian church father named John Chrysostom. And he wrote about, about why Jesus needed to suffer in this way, why, why his whole body needed to suffer this abuse. Uh, he wrote, Not only one of the Lord's members, but his entire body had to suffer the most dreadful pains. His head was wounded by the crown of thorns, by the blows of the fist, and by the reed. His face endured spittle and smiting. His body was scourged, stripped, and arrayed in a robe of shape. His hands held the reed. Later, his tongue had to taste vinegar and gall. Because sin dwells and is active in all our members, therefore Christ suffered, desired to suffer for our sins in all his members. You know, a bully 
really tries to leverage power and control over you. And so if you are ever victimized by a bully, it might seem as though you have no control. It might seem as though you have no choice but just to obey the bully. Well, in that sense, sin is like that bully. Right? Sin tries, and successfully so, to coerce us into bad behavior. Satan is a bully. He, he browbeats us into actions that are harmful, that are destructive for ourselves, and that are hurtful and offensive to our God who loves us. You know, the Apostle Paul, he, he wrote about in Scripture uh, uh, about that, that fight, that battle against those bullies of sin and Satan. And, and he wrote about how difficult it was and how hopeless it was at times. And he, he wrote, The good I want to do, I do not do. The evil I wish to desire, that is what I keep on doing. The Apostle Paul writes that, and right away we know exactly what he's talking about, don't we? Because we can relate. We felt the, the blows from that bully of Satan. We felt that, that temptation to sin. We felt that hopelessness and that fight, that battle against it, that we just can't win. Well, the Apostle Paul, he, he, he expresses that frustration of that battle, of that fight against those bullies of sin and temptation and Satan. And in his despair, he cries out then in the very next verse, who will rescue me? But Paul puts that question out there, but he doesn't leave it out there hanging too long before he answers it himself. Because the Apostle Paul knows the answer. He knows the answer by faith. And joyfully he says it. Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gives us victory against those bullies. And we know exactly how he did it. He did it by taking our place, by making himself our substitute. He stepped in and he endured all those blows from, from our bully Satan. He endured all those painful temptations, the same ones we do and yet even more can't even imagine. He endured all those blows from our bully Satan, but he endured all of them perfectly. He never gave in. He never sinned. Not once he was perfect. He sent that bully Satan running. And then on top of that, he took our place as our substitute yet again. And this time he took our place as our substitute to endure our punishment for all of our sins, all the sins of the past, all the sins of our future. He took them all in our place. And he endured their pain, their suffering, their punishment in his body on the cross. And because our bully Satan has been defeated, because sin has been punished, right, those bullies, they've lost their power over us. They have been completely defeated. And it's on that basis that God makes us some incredible promises. God promises, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Again, Satan has been defeated, so God promises, resist him. He will flee. He is powerless. He's already been defeated by Christ. And God promises, sin shall no longer be your master. You are not under the law, under grace. And we are not under the law because, because both the, the demands and the punishment of the law, they have been fully met in Christ. We are not under the law. We are under grace. And that means we don't have to live in dread of sin. As though we commit one sin and suddenly we're condemned for eternity. Suddenly then our relationship with God would be shattered. No, we're not, under, we're not under the law. We are under grace. We are under the rule of God's grace and forgiveness. We see our Savior beaten and brutalized. And we know exactly what that was for. And not so that we feel pity for him, but so that we might rejoice in the depths of his forgiving love for us. So that we might see in that the evidence that our sins have been forgiven not under the law. We are under grace. And so we have been set free. We have been set free from those bullies of sin and Satan. And so the question then is, well, what do we do with that freedom? Do we run right back to those things? Of course not. Right? Well, what a foolish waste of that freedom that, that Christ has won for us would be if we just ran right back to that which Christ has freed us from. Just the opposite. We use that freedom that Christ has won for us to glorify God and to serve our neighbor. We use the, the freedom that Christ has won for us to be more Christ-like as he enables us. To turn the other cheek. To pray for our enemies, for our bullies, for those who persecute us. 
to do unto others as, as we would have them do unto us. We use the freedom that Christ has won for us to, to live not for ourselves, but for him who loves us and gave himself up for us. And when those bullies of sin and Satan come calling, we stand confidently against them and we resist them. For we know that Christ has already defeated them. Thanks be to God. Amen.